Oh, you want me to talk? Good morning, everybody. And welcome to, to the innovation series of B-Link. Um, this is new, guys, uh, a webinar on, on, on Zoom. So I hope you guys all uh, logged in and you guys are ready to go. You're very welcome. Um, it was a bit... Um, uh, uh, fresh here at uh, um, in Lincoln, um, a bit a bit uh, frosty this morning, but I can assure you that the speakers that we have today are um, making making us think, and hopefully we will get uh, um, rid of that frosty feeling this morning. I am going to share my screen with you, and I'm going to introduce. Um, the uh, uh, the speakers and do a little bit of, of household so bear with me please i'm just looking at my moderator can everybody see my screen I think we can. Well, like I said, welcome to um, uh, Protein Shift Innovation Series, the first time that we're doing this online. Um, and I'm go going through uh, some of the household uh, uh, items this morning, and I will give you a little bit of an introduction to Beluk Innovation. <clears throat> Beluk Innovation is a business unit of Lincoln University, but we're very separate uh, in a sense that uh, we um, are trying to connect people and of course by you joining us this morning with this with this innovation series you are already connecting with uh, with us and with a lot of with a lot of the speakers what we would actually see then most of the time after these connections people people are getting um, uh, through these connections people start to talk to each other and people start start to really collaborate and the cool thing about collaboration is that um, you create a win-win situation. So two, two no more than one. So most of the time, cool innovations actually come out of that. And that's when you actually see on screen here as well that Blink basically pivots around connectivity, collaboration, and uh, eventually um, in innovation. Um, <clears throat> housekeeping for today. Um, this webinar will be recorded. So, with other words, um, um, if you um, uh, want to uh, go back or want to share or uh, um, uh, want to want to re-listen, that that will that will all be possible. So, with other words, you can just sit back, relax. You don't need to take notes if you want to, and you can you can um, uh, watch the recording over and over and over again. <clears throat> um, we also talked about um, uh, collaborating and, and, and connecting, and the way we are going to do that, or that you are going to do that uh, today, is basically using the Q&A function. Um, as you're using Zoom, on the bottom of, of your Zoom uh, um, uh, um, uh, page, if you move your mouse around, you see a Q&A function. Um, we will use that Q&A function to ask questions. And if you think that somebody really asked a good question and you can basically use your thumbs up by basically saying, hey, this is a really good question. So then I know for sure that if I need to make a selection, the end of the, the end of the protein, uh, at the end of this innovation series, that will answer the questions that had the most likes, so to say. Um, <clears throat> all the, all the, the, the um, uh, all of you are muted. And so the only way to communicate with us is through your is through the Q and A, and only the speakers uh, have the ability to talk to you. Um, but you can do more if you think uh, if if you're not already connected with us, please connect with us, and you can do it on Twitter, LinkedIn, or um, uh, uh, Facebook. But you could also say, well, hey, listen, I want to come down to Blink and um, uh, do an event at, at Blink because we have a really, really nice workshop that you can actually um, uh, come, especially when we get down to level one again. Um, but also we have uh, um, uh, tenants that uh, do hot desking and or have their permanent permanent address here in our in our workshop. So, yeah, you you are very welcome to join us there as well. 
Um, today's speakers, um, I am very, very, very lucky to be uh, joined by three speakers uh, today. Um, we have Sue Trafford, and we have Karen Zinn, and we have Kate Atlington. Um, and um, so I, what I'll do is, before every um, a speaker actually goes into their topic, and of course, you know, we're talking about the protein shift, so all three speakers will talk about protein in some sort, in some, some form or another. Um, I, will give, I will give you a brief introduction. And we will start with the first speaker, and it, it is my great, in, uh, my great honor to introduce um, uh, Sue Trafford. Um, I consider Sue Trafford not only a very valuable uh, colleague, but also uh, a friend, um, as I've been lucky enough to actually work with her and actually learn from her as well. So I hope that you will actually be able to do that as well today. Um, <clears throat> Sue moved from the North Island uh, to Canterbury, and um, and from that, the, the, her experience was basically um, a, a conventional beef and dairy farm. And then they actually joined uh, Lincoln University and um, start teaching and doing research on uh, uh, producing protein in the New Zealand uh, environment. But the dream was also basically starting to connect with farmers, uh, sorry, with consumers. So basically um, practicing what they were teaching to these, uh, to these students and basically doing it, them, doing it themselves. They started doing that uh, uh, about, uh, I think about, about a little bit over a year ago by starting their own uh, um, uh, boutique dairy shop in town and that is basically supported by their sheep dairy farm that they ha had already a l for a, a longer period in time um, but i'm gonna i'm gonna give the mic over to sue so what i'm gonna do now is i'm gonna stop sharing and uh, sue will take over and again if you guys have questions please put them in in the q a section Thank you, Vim. It's um, really nice to be here. Nice to reconnect with you. I left Lincoln in December, and I, we haven't really had a chance to catch up before that, to, until now. So, um, yeah, this is a really good initiative, and I'm happy to be part of it. Um, welcome all the people that are connecting um, with today's session. Um, I'm here with my husband, Guy. We're life partners, but also business partners. And what, we, what I'm going to sort of cover today is the journey that we have undertaken in trying to um, research and implement um, a, a new uh, pastoral farming paradigm in Canterbury. And I'm going to discuss the, the rationale for that and how we did it, where we're at, and, and try and convince you that sheep dairying is the answer to every farmer's prayer. So, uh, in 2012, following damage to um, our house in the, in the spate of earthquakes that happened in Christchurch, um, we bought a small rural business, a small farmlet um, near Darfield in the dry farming country in Canterbury. And then we looked at what we may be able to do with it in order to make some money for it to pay for the investment that we had made in it. Uh, we looked at a range of options. It was 10 hectares, which is very small. It had a nice house. We could have a comfortable life and we're nearing retirement. And so we, we looked at what we might be able to do and what opportunities might open up around it for us to, to maybe build, extend, and provide a retirement, a retirement-based income for ourselves. Um, we looked at horticultural crops. Um, things to pick, grow, sell at markets and shops in Christchurch. And as we'd had a long history with sheep and beef farming, we looked at um, producing lambs to sell to, to, the, to the market. 
However, almost all the options that we considered really either didn't appeal or they just weren't going to yield enough profitability to make it worth the effort. In the meantime, both Guy and I, and Guy is sitting next to me here, so I'm sure he will chip in with some comments if something pops up. Um, we both were working at Lincoln as lecturers, and so we had a little money to set this, to set this up, um, and very little time. So it was quite a challenge at the beginning. We realised that we wanted to do more than just farm or produce um, protein products. Uh, we wanted to build a full um, integrated value, ch value chain, a plate to paddock approach. Um, and we hoped that what we were going to do might reveal insights into developing, growing, building a new paradigm around uh, to overcome some of the farming system challenges that were occurring in Canterbury and were kind of extrapolable across um, New Zealand. Um, we could see from the farming um, families and the situation around us that sheep and beef farming was really struggling um, profitability wise. Cow dairying was under significant pressure to reduce its environmental footprint, um, had labour challenges, and we did not really want to reinvent that wheel. And so we put our thinking caps on. We'd had a, a, a history of, of farming long term. Guy had been, we've been farm owners and Guy had been farm managing. I, I'd done some food marketing and teaching. I was really interested in farm system resilience. And so it was an opportunity for us to, to reinvent ourselves and to reinvent what we had done previously. We were getting really clear signals that consumers were communicating that they wanted to see food produced in a different kind of way. And certainly we had noticed from our previous farming history and from people who were farming around us that they wanted more, more um, what would the word be? They wanted more resilience in their systems and they definitely wanted to have profitable, more profitable farming systems. So we did lots of research. And it was obvious from a lot of our reading that we needed to look at something that wasn't particularly available or well used in the New Zealand situation. We like milk, we drink milk, we see milk as a part of a well balanced um, uh, diet. And so we looked at how we could um, produce milk from a smaller ruminant than a cow that would offer some op um, opportunities to reduce the environmental footprint um, and utilize some of the farming skills that we already had as we'd had a lot of experience with sheep in the past. We also felt that there were a lot of nutrient and sensory qualities around sheep milk that were not recognized but offered huge advantages over cow milk and the, and the alternatives like oat milk and soy milk that were available as alternatives. So we decided to put our money where our mouth is and we went for it. So we put some infrastructure, fencing, um, water, water reticulation on our little property and we built a dairy shed and then we built a little processing factory and we set up Charing Cross Sheep Dairy. So we've been going about eight years and it has developed considerably We've learned an awful lot, and I'm not sure we're making a hell of a lot of money, but we're well on our way. So I'm just going to move to the next slide. So for those of you who are not familiar with New Zealand, there are um, a number of New Zealand traditional pastoral farming systems, like you can beef, deer, are really struggling. Um, we noticed, especially in dry land areas of New Zealand, like Canterbury, that had traditionally been um, arable sheep and beef or mixed systems, that the returns for sheep were historically poor and often very volatile. Frustrating for farmers. We noticed that most of the, the average age of farmers is well into the 60s. Um, we've been farming for a long time ourselves and we had noticed and felt really frustrated with a number of the, the aspects of traditional farming systems and a circuit breaker was needed. So we wanted a we wanted a sheep based system. We like sheep. We're familiar with them. We had a small property. 
leading the business that I could be part of and Sheep would enable that rather than Sodia or Hannah. We also needed to look at um, a system that would return um, a, a, a justify an investment in irrigation as irrigation was becoming increasingly applied across Canterbury to overcome the problems of drought and just difficulties producing off um, very dry land through the summer. For me, it was really important, and, and also for Guy, that, that we had a, an underpinning ethos of responsible agricultural production. We wanted to do something that was kind to the land, kind to the people, kind to the animals, right through the value chain. And so with all of that in mind, we chose to set up a sheep dairy. Um, very unusual in Canterbury. There were very, at this, at that, we were the first one since the 1990s. Um, people looked sort of askance at us because it was just such a departure from current systems and practice. But I travelled, we'd eaten a lot of really good sheep cheese and we kind of knew that it was a traditional European um, farming practice. Beautiful food was produced from sheep's milk. It had a whole lot of really excellent qualities. And if nothing else, we could make uh, cheese because it's um, sheep's milk produces very high yielding um, sheep cheeses. So we felt that we could have, a, at least for starting with, with um, cheese, we could ha have an, an early and hopefully profitable income stream. Sheep's milk, internationally sheep's milk has been has been seen as contributing to meeting the desire for consumers for products that promote human health or reduce stress and disease. And there's an awful lot of literature out there that says that it's good for you. Um, we were aware that a large proportion of the world's population, many, especially in Asia, have an allergy to cow's milk. They drink it, but do not always feel well on it. And that cow's milk is one of the most common allergies in young children. And so we noticed even through friends and, and, and discussions on the internet that people were pulling away from, from drinking cow's milk and going to alternatives. The research we did showed that sheep's milk had much better sensory and nutritional qualities than some of the, the alternatives, um, plant-based foods food um, that's turned into milk, like oat milk or soy milk. So we thought we were onto a winner. So this slide um, is a, com a nutritional comparison of, of, of the different kinds of milk that can be got. Um, obviously, there's human in there, which is a, not very many people other than babies drink human milk. But cow, sheep, and goat, it's interesting that sheep have superior um, figures right across every bracket of, the, of this table. And we could see real opportunities to capitalize by producing products that, that use, those, um, use those wins to produce products that would actually make a difference to people. So you'll notice there that sheep have a much higher percentage of milk solids than goats or cow, and that enables um, um, cheeses to be made that um, well, you get more, more cheese for your, for your milk inputs, high in fat, which for some people may seem to be a problem, but when you're cheese making and for a number of products, that's a real benefit. It's really, um, it's, it's, it's a good, it's a good as attribute um, when you're producing food across the human lifespan, they, young children, babies, people who are older or infirm, um, needing supplements, um, fat can be a good thing. It's very high in protein, really high in calcium, and one high in calories, that hooks back to the, to the percentage of um, fat and sugars that are a benefit to people who are needing extra supplementation in, through, through functional foods. It's a bit hard to see this, but um, this, is a, this is a little piece of information that we supply to people who want to know about sheep's milk. And it contains a number of pretty impressive nutritional facts. 
and indicated to us that sheep's milk was much more a protein powerhouse than any of the other um, alternatives that we could we could find or or do for do much higher in vitamins and, and, and minerals. Um, it contains because of the fat and it, Mostly, it has a high cal calorific value, but it's great for people recuperating from illnesses and particularly accessed by high performance athletes. It has um, a number of um, vitamin advantages, um, medium, fat medium chain fatty, um, fatty acids and amino acids. It helps the body produce energy. It's lower in sodium, which can be a benefit for people who have high blood pressure or arterial issues. Um, it isn't exactly naturally homogenized. The sheep doesn't homogenize it, but it comes out of the sheep with very small fat globules, which make it digestible and it make, the tiny molecules enable it to go through the gut wall at a lot faster rate than any of the other milk, milk um, comparative milks. It has lactose, but it has some advantages in lactose, which will come up in, in, in later slides. It helps um, limit or inhibit cholesterol deposits. Um, it does, it's an A1, it has, it has no A1 beta morphine, casein morphines. It's an A2 milk. Um, it also, we could, and, and other sheep dairies do, that they do not milk the sheep when they're pregnant, which is um, quite a a departure from other animals where cows, for example, are often heavily pregnant when they're being milked. And, that, and so there's, there's some questions around what happens <coughs> to those hormones when they're in the human body. So at this point, we were starting to realise that we had, that sheep dairying was a, was a winner in terms of sensory and, and nutritional qualities. And that there were opportunities here that we could utilize that we couldn't get from other protein sources. So I just want to reiterate that sheep and goat milk have high concentrations of, of um, fat globules that go through the gut wall really, really quickly. And so that discomfort um, that people get when they drink milk um, and they feel bloated or have gut disturbances or diarrhea, um, tends not to happen with sheep and goat milk. And so it it meets the needs of it meets the needs of a lot of a lot of people with who have challenges through their lifespan with the digestibility of cow's milk. It does contain lactose, but actually the proportion of lactose in the milk in proportion to this comparative to cow's milk, the total solids in cow's milk is much less, and so there's much less disruption to the gut as a result of that. So this indicated to us that there was a high untapped potential as a functional food, and that with, with um, antioxidant, antimicrobial, antihypertension, people like me with high blood pressure, there were advantages, um, strong support for the immune system, and strong support for protecting the heart and the arteries, that this was something that there must have been a niche in here that we could tap to turn, um, to, to develop a business around. Um, I might quickly go through this. I, I think it's really interesting that one of the, one of the stated advantages of sheep milk mm -hmm. is that it has a huge protection for the heart. And, and so, Arteries, arteries in the heart um, have have uh, are advantaged by the, the people who could, by the consumption of sheep's milk versus the other the other types of, of milk drink. And Guy and I are getting older, in our sixties, and um, looking at sort of how long we're going to how long we're going to live and how we're going to look after our bodies going into the future. And so this seemed particularly appealing. And so, nutritionally, it's a, it's, it's a superb milk. I don't think it can be eaten, but it also has a whole lot of other functional uses, and a number of people have developed um, cosmetics, um, prepar preparations for the skin, a whole lot of uh, using sheep's milk as in preparations that go on the outside of the human body rather than inside it. 
Um, and most people will know that Cleopatra used milk, and milk has traditionally been used to as a um, as an application to the body, as a, as a moisturizer, providing vitamins and minerals, and all those unique characteristics of sheep's milk, which tend to go into the body, can also be applied to the outside with benefits for humans, especially eczema um, and skin stuff that allergies that require some extra attention. So it's incredibly multifunctional. One of the other appeals of, sheep's, of sheep, sheep milk and, dairy, and sheep dairying was that it, has, it had the potential to have a much lighter footprint on the land. That was important to us. Um, we noticed when we came to Canterbury that there was a lot of negative press around about cow dairying. Tents of um, cow dairying had put real pressures on the quality and quantity of water take, and, and there was a lot of pushback um, by, by rural, um, rural dwellers, but also a lot of urban people who felt that cow dairying wasn't owning the externalities it was producing in terms of pollution into waterways. And that, that needed to be addressed. And we saw sheep dairy as providing an opportunity to address that in a major way. New um, water management rules had come into Canterbury requiring um, dairy farmers to reduce their, the proportion of nitrogen that was uh, released into the ground. And many farmers were struggling to understand how they might do that, especially under intensified um, irrigation, where they were having to pay a lot of water, a lot of money for water applications and, and infrastructure. And they would have to apply mitigation measures to meet, to meet new compliance um, levels. Cowdering economics at, that, at the time we got into it, about 2012, wasn't likely to make that easy. And many farmers would have to drop the number of cows. So we did an analysis of what cow, cow dairying, um, how dark cow dairying's profitability would, would stack up against um, sheep dairying. And there was some research that said that it, we could expect that it would, that the release application of, of nitrogen to land would be about a third of cow dairy. And using um, Environment Canterbury, the, the regional um, compliance organisation's guidelines, we did an analysis of uh, budgets and we found that not only could we um, produce milk at a much lower level than we expected, but that was actually incredibly, incredibly low comparing, comparison to cow. And there are a number of reasons for that. Sheep are little, they pee in a different kind of way, um, less of it, they've got smaller bladders, and a whole lot of things stacked up that it was a real answer to the challenges of, of cow dairy, and yet still producing a protein, uh, protein milk that could be turned into products that would resonate with the people who were finding the, the issues around cow dairy and not owning its externalities. And so that really appealed to us as well. So there are, we're starting to stack a number of really positive attributes of, cow, of sheep dairy that couldn't be done by the other available um, milk protein options that, we, we, that were possibilities for us. So we like this, sounded great. Those of you. So there's another, there were another couple of aspects of sheep dairy that really appealed. Sheep, dairy sheep, are very fecund. They produce a number of lambs, sometimes three, four, three, four five. And so um, sheep and their lambs produce a multiple income stream for farmers. And so we could have meat, milk, and wool, although wool is pretty pathetic at the moment. And so it, looked, it was starting to stack up as a farming system that had real benefits. And we could see that we could build a business based on a kind of a moniker of a smarter, simpler, kinder, and that we could, that, that would resonate with what consumers were conveying to us that were important credence attributes for them. We also liked the fact that it had some social benefits. 
that we weren't seeing a cow dairying, um, sheep a little, um, the easy to, 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 and less intimidating the cows to work with. Um, we could see some ways that people could integrate cow uh, into their existing cow or sheep or um, and beef systems, a, an aspect of sheep dairying that would allow them to um, allow parents to stay on farm and or children to stay on farm and have multiple um, multiple income streams to build, and build equity. And yeah, we just it, it, there's a whole lot of, of things around um, sheep dairying, labour supply and quality. Women attracted to it, they could work part time. You could milk once a day. You could fit the rhythms of sheep dairying around the, the nature of the labour supply much easier than you could with cows. So the road ahead, there was this, we saw huge potential, but um, we're now into 2020 and we notice it's a game of two halves. There are some big dairies in the North Island now. I think there are about 16 dairy, dairy produced, cheap dairy producers in New Zealand, some really big ones. The majority of them are small, like us, boutique, and there's a, a lagging development in the South Island. The major issue is the, there's a lack of regional processes and, and limited marketing options. And so the answer for us has been to develop a complete um, value chain. So we, make, we milk the sheep, we make the product, and we sell it. And we've developed a cheese shop, as Vin said, in Christchurch in order to capitalise and, and, and clip the ticket right across that value chain. There's very little industry cohesion and so not a lot of support for small players, but that will build, just we just need to get consumers, marketers to understand that sheep dairy is just, um, it produces a magic product and we need to capitalise that. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sue. And uh, that was uh, very informative. And we already have uh, a couple of questions. But what we'll do is we'll answer those at the end of um, uh, the session. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce the next uh, speaker. So again, I'm going to share my screen. And I do apologize that this is. Yep. <clears throat> so I'm going to introduce uh, the second speaker, uh, uh, Karen Zinn. And Karen Zinn uh, works for the Auckland University of Technology. And uh, very much like the previous speaker, Sue, uh, she is combining theory with practice as well. Um, and she's doing that, she's using all her 23 years of her experience to do that. She's looking at, at the concept of whole food. Uh, she's an author of, of, of books, um, a senior lecturer, but she's also a dietitian. And so she can really look at things, uh, uh, yeah, fr from, a, from a holistic point of view. So whether we can uh, compare proteins with proteins like we do apples with apples, I think Karen will actually uh, tell us all about that. Um, and with this, I introduce uh, Karen Zinn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vim. Um, and good morning to everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. So um, hopefully you can see my starting slide there. If somebody can give me a thumbs up, that would be, that would be great. Yes, we can. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, right, so, so again, thank you for the opportunity um, to talk with you today. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about um, with regards to protein are um, three major areas around, around protein itself. So I'm going to be looking at the role of protein and its requirements across the lifespan. I'm going to look at, um, look at balancing eating optimally and also respecting the environment. And then I'm going to be looking at some nutritional considerations with regards to different protein sources. So to kick off, firstly, I don't think people really appreciate the widespread role that, that protein has in the body. So protein is um, 
a biologically essential nutrient. And uh, what I what I mean by that is is that unlike carbohydrate or glucose, which in its absence the body can make its own, um, that's not the case with, with protein. So eight of the twenty. Um, amino acids that, that we find in protein are essential and our bodies cannot produce those um, essential amino acids, which means that we're really reliant on the diet to provide us with those, with those amino acids. So, um, so, that's, so that's one of the key kind of characteristics of protein. But again, when it comes to protein's role in the body, we, when you think about how important protein is, we kind of default to that. It's really important, important for building uh, muscle and, um, and repair of tissues. And that is correct. But have a look here, and I'm not going to go through these, uh, um, all of these, but have a look here at the wide range of protein functions that we get in the body. Um, like I said, I'm not going to go through them all, but um, you know, when it comes to metabolic reactions, everything that takes place in the body requires an enzyme to be involved. Enzymes are um, are compounds that um, help um, help reactions take place, uh, help compounds change structure, help digestion, help pretty much everything. And all enzymes are proteins. Uh, we've got protein as a messenger function, so hormones provide structures such as um, collagen, um, keratin, elastin for hair, nails, teeth. Um, we have muscle contraction function. Protein has an essential role in balancing um, the body pH and balancing the body's fluid um, levels. And of course, protein has an, a very important role in the immune function um, with synthesizing or being involved in, um, in antibodies. And of course, at the moment, uh, the immune system is a hot topic with, with COVID-19 um, on, on the radar and protein has an important um, role to play there with the immune function. Nutrient transport, blood clotting, another one, providing energy, but also protein is, um, is the macronutrient that has the greatest level of satiation or feeling of fullness. And that is, a re that is another really important function of, of protein that I think is underestimated. Because if we are satiated um, with our foods and our meals, um, it is unlikely that we're going to be turning to other foods for, um, for inter-meal snacking. And that can certainly help with our overweight and our obesity crisis. Okay, I want to talk a little bit next about our daily protein requirements, or our RDI, recommended daily intake of protein. Now, we guide the population two ways when it comes to protein requirements. And the first way is looking at a percentage guideline. So we, we say that people need to have between 15 and 25% of their total energy intake coming from protein. Um, a more... Um, a more user-friendly way of guiding people is in terms of grams per kilogram. So we've got a guideline that is, is pretty much across the, across the globe. So everyone's got the same default guideline. As, and I want you to look at the column which has the little um, red dotted um, square or rectangle around it. We guide our population to eat 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight of protein per day, okay? So um, when it comes to the 70 kilogram individual, which is just kind of classified as an, as an average individual, uh, an average male weight, that comes to 56 grams of protein. For those who might not know, that is less than 180 gram size steak. So somewhere between kind of your palm and your hand size, that's what 180 gram steak looks like. That is what we are guided to eat um, for total protein in a day. Okay, so um, if you're thinking how I'm thinking, not very much. So when we look at some of the, the, the more recent analysis of these protein recommendations, there is an indication that the level of protein intake is way too low for many people. Um, and one of the key limitations of this RDI, recommended daily intake, is that it reflects the minimum amount of protein as opposed to the optimal level um, of protein for a person. Um, so as an example, we have 
certain population groups like um, adolescents that would need up to two grams per kilogram body weight of protein. Um, we've got um, athletes that need at least 1.2 up to two grams per kilogram uh, body weight of protein. And we have um, a growing group of older adults where um, when, when, they get, well, when we get a bit older, uh, one of the biggest issues we have is retaining muscle mass. And sarcopenia, which is muscle wasting, is a condition which affects older adults. Um, it's, it's prolific, and it's really indicating that protein intakes of the older adult population need to be a lot higher. So you can see there um, the, the amount of grams that would be required um, for 1.5 um, grams per kilogram body weight. So for someone who's 70 kilos, uh, we, we're looking at around 105 um, grams of protein. Or up to two grams per kilogram body weight, we'll be looking at about 140 grams of protein. Um, just to give you an idea on my on the kind of diet that, that I would eat, which is a whole food based diet, um, which is moderately low in carbohydrate, probably higher in fat than the average population, and I would say very moderate in protein, I would eat, and I'm not 70 kilos, I'm a little lighter than that, I would eat around 90 to 100 grams of protein a, a day. And we're not talking masses amounts of, of meat, just how protein is spread across the foods. So, um, so I, I will just um, have a take home from the slide and saying that our protein recommendations are grossly underestimated. And this is reflected um, quite poignantly in this Eat Lancet report, which um, for those of you who are not aware, it's a report that was released in, um, at the start of 2019. And it's a document that outlines what we need to do as a, as a world to be able to feed our 10 billion um, population by 2050. So it's all about health and sustainability. And um, it looks at a sample diet. So this diet that I've um, shown here comes directly out of the Eat Lancet report. And it guides us as to how we need to eat um, so that we can become carbon neutral and, um, and improve sustainability, sustainability and reduce resources to produce enough food to feed everyone. And when you look at an analysis of this, of this diet, you can see, firstly, that the the, the protein recommendation is, is very low, okay? Um, and it shows that it is 14% of total energy as protein, which is less than the minimum threshold of that 15 to 25% um, that we, we guide people to eat. What's also interesting about this report, if you just look at the information that's contained within the two yellow circles, um, under dairy and under um, protein sources in general, you can see that the amounts that they suggest we eat um, is they're incredibly low 14 grams of beef lamb and pork um, 13 grams of eggs that is that amounts to about one egg a week or one and a half eggs a week um, and the interesting thing about um, about the range that they provide um, that they provide in this report is that the lowest edge of the range is zero. So really, if you read between the lines, they are really endorsing a plant-only way of eating. So they are saying this is where animals fit in, but they are saying actually the lowest level that you can have is zero, indicating that plant-only or veganism is very much a, a, an endorsed entity. And while that is one, one level of um, thought, uh, that, in, in my view, can be potentially problematic from a future nutrition and health, and health perspective. Um, so, unfortunately, they put animals in, an, uh, unfairly, I think, in a bad light from a health perspective throughout the report and also from a sustainability perspective because, of course, they're not taking into account the New Zealand situation of farming, which is incredibly different, I've, in my limited knowledge, from, um, from what happens overseas in terms of resourcing and um, carbon sequestration. So let's have a look at some of the nutrients. So here we've got a slide where um, the top three pictures are, are all animal derived and the bottom three are all plant derived. So undoubtedly, 
um, animals provide the richest source of nutrients. So they have the essential fatty, uh, sorry, not essential fatty acids. Uh, they've got essential amino acids. Um, they've got a complete complement within your, your animal sources. So for, for example, um, an egg gives you your complete complement of, um, of amino acids, particularly essential ones. They also contain good amounts per unit um, of, of nutrients like iron, like zinc, like choline, vitamin A, vitamin D. They have omega-3 fatty acids in the most bioavailable form, so the most um, the form that's able to be used best by the body. And um, importantly, they provide vitamin B12, which is the nutrient that is absent from plant proteins. So at the bottom, plant proteins, we've, we've got, um, we've got um, tofu and um, tempeh, we've got uh, legumes and legume derivatives and beans and nuts and seeds, and we've also got um, things like chia seeds and linseeds and, and hemp seeds. And now these are all nutrient-rich plant sources of protein, uh, but um, you just need to take that much more care um, in planning your diet in order to get them all. Plus, you need to eat a lot more of these foods to get enough of some of these nutrients. Um, a couple of things to mention here is that the form in which plant, um, plant protein provides iron is not the most bioavailable to the body, and the same with omega-3. So we get a lot of omega-3s from things like walnuts and chia seeds and hemp seeds, which are great, but they're not in as an absorbable form or bioavailable form um, by the body as you would get from things like um, fatty fish and eggs and animal products. Um, the other thing about plant-based protein is that they do contain phytates, and what phytates do is phytates bind with um, nutrients like iron and like zinc and to a certain extent calcium. They form insoluble complexes and they are um, excreted from the body. So that can be potentially problematic um, in reducing the, the bioavailability of the existing nutrients. Also, some of plant, um, your plant-based foods are also higher in carbohydrate. And I know the session's not about carbohydrate, but um, I have a, um, an evidence-based view that we overeat carbohydrate. And in actual fact, we need to reduce our overall carbohydrate load and look at better quality carbohydrates. Um, moving on to the next slide, this kind of stuff worries me. So this, and, and I, I've only picked on this one just because it was one of 10 um, plant-based uh, products that, that are reviewed. And when you look at the ingredients, you can see that you've got a range of things there. You've got your, your vegetable protein coming from wheat, soy, and pea. You've got canola oil in there. Now, canola, canola oil is a very high, um, it's a very highly processed oil. It has a high content of omega-6 fats and in greater quantity or in great quantities can be inflammatory for the body. And all you have to do is go through the supermarket and look at pretty much everything which has, uh, which is in a packet, like your salad dressings and your mayonnaises and even your roasted nuts and your sauces, even your breads that have sunflower oil, canola oil, um, and those seed oils, which tend to be highly processed and also contain omega-6 inflammatory oils. So these products, they tend to put canola oil or sunflower oil in them. And you can see other um, ingredients such as starch or tapioca, um, etc. Et, et and then, of course, they've got to add the iron, the zinc, the vitamin B12 for the fortification. So... Um, what I want to know is, firstly, what is the impact of these foods on the environment? And I don't think these, this has been taken into account. And also, what is the effect if, if people do go plant only um, and they start eating these foods for their protein and their nutrients, what's going to happen to their overall health? Because essentially, when you look at a product like this, to me, it resembles a food that is ultra-processed. So it's not too dissimilar to the range and the, the long list of nutrients that you would find in uh, things like a packet of chips. Okay, so, um, so some take homes for the consumer and some take homes for the growers. So um, three points here for the consumer. I believe that consumers need to focus on good quality proteins. And I think, I, I do believe really strongly that 
animals and plant protein are really important for overall health and nutrient provision. Of course, if, um, if people want to be plant only or, or vegans, they can absolutely, for, for humanitarian reasons, they can do it perfectly provided they take more care and supplement their diet, particularly with vitamin 12. I think if P, uh, B12, I think if people um, turn to plant only because of sustainability, environmental reasons, and for health reasons, there is a bigger story there. And I don't believe um, that's necessarily a valid argument. Number two, I think that protein needs to be consumed at each meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, the role of protein is widespread and um, we need to get enough protein. Um, and if we put protein in every meal for a more balanced approach to our meals, then that satiety factor, that feeling of fullness factor will be satisfied. Number three, the Ministry of Health have recommended a red meat limit to 500 grams a week. And while I, 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 I think, just on a personal level, that this has been a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction to the whole sustainability, let's, um, let's eat less meat, um, that we're getting particularly from the Eat Lancet report. And we're starting to see this in, let's take meat and dairy out of our hospitals and um, let's develop education resources for children to tell them to eat less meat and dairy. And I, I, I would say that I don't necessarily agree with that. But what I will say is that 500 grams a week of red meat is actually, it, it, it's ample. So um, that allows for three to four dinner meals that give you between 125 and 160 grams. So again, palm to hand size, piece of uh, meat, fish, chicken, lamb, whatever. Oh, sorry, not fish. We're talking about red meat here. So, um, so, so beef, lamb, as an example. And then we've got plenty other meals in the week where we can have other foods. So from a nutrition perspective, I would say two fish meals a week are recommended. And particularly because fish gives you that independent, independent um, benefit um, and mostly from um, omega-3s if you choose fatty fish, which I'd recommend. And then, of course, there are plenty other meals for dinner and for lunch and breakfast where you can put your chicken, your pork, your eggs, your dairy, um, your, your milk dairy, your sheep dairy. I, I really like this inclusion of, of sheep dairy. Um, it's really nice to see the nutrition profile there. And also vegetarian sources. So um, I don't necessarily believe, while I don't necessarily agree with that red meat limit from a sustainability perspective, I do think that um, that it, it is fair. And there are a lot of people eating a lot more meat, but it's typically the people um, in the US that are eating hot dogs and hamburgers on every corner. Um, take homes for the growers, farmers and food industry. So firstly, I think with animals, it comes to diversity and um, insects. So Insects don't seem to be embraced to the same extent as they do in other countries, particularly Eastern countries, Asian countries. Um, I, I know that cricket protein is becoming a lot more um, talked about and it's on the market now and it's excellent. The nutrition profile is, is excellent. Uh, but insects themselves um, as meals we don't uh, we don't seem to be embracing. So I think there's an opportunity there. And um, just my little point about offal. Um, this is more for the food industry. Let's try and make offal sexy. Let's try and not waste um, these amazingly rich nutrition sources of the animal and eat nose to tail. How do you make offal sexy? Well, we dip it with with chicken um, liver pate or beef liver pate. Um, when I tell my clients or suggest to my clients to eat to eat liver, they pull their nose up. But when I suggest pate, um, they go, oh yeah, I can do that. So I think we need to do a bit more work to make offal sexy so that we, um, we get people eating this um, more readily. From a plant perspective, um, again, diversity. So in Australia, um, Australians are producing lupin, which is a, um, which is a legume. Uh, but why I really like lupin is that um, it's different from legumes because it's got a much higher protein composition uh, typically than legumes and it's very low in carbohydrates. So in terms of um, the, my nutrition philosophies, um, it, it really kind of ticks all the boxes. Hemp seed, again, really, really good. This stuff is coming through. We're seeing it um, more in, in the supermarkets and that's great. Um, and I think seaweed from a... Um, 
from a protein perspective, seaweed has surprisingly quite a lot of protein compared to what you would imagine. And I think there's some potentially some um, opportunities there for, for edible seaweeds. And the final takeaway is, is that um, we need to consider the end product, the, the quality of the end product. And it would be very disappointing if we see a whole lot of plant-based proteins that are posing as animals, um, such as the product on the previous slide, because that is just going to be a move towards um, having more ultra-processed foods and our health is going to decline um, a, a, as a consequence, I believe. So the focus is, for me, is on whole unprocessed foods wherever possible. So um, in, in general, the main take home message for me um, is that animals and plant proteins together um, have, a, have an incredibly important role to play in both the health and also the health of our people and also the sustainability of our planet. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, can you switch on my video, please? Well, hopefully you you can hear me. You can't see me. Um, you can see me now, and you can probably also see that the sun has started to shine here in Lincoln. So that's that is kind of good. Um, um, thanks very much, um, uh, uh, Karen, for uh, your uh, uh, presentation. Um, I see questions coming in, really, really good. Um, and again, uh, I will uh, moderate uh, answering the questions uh, after the next speaker that I'm going to introduce. And for some reason or another, this is not working. Bear with me, guys. And this is working. Cool. Thank you very much for bearing with us. Um, <clears throat> at least you can't see me stumbling around uh, um, uh, over the stage, what I normally do. So this is me stumbling with uh, with technology. But uh, with for, uh, without uh, uh, holding you uh, any longer, we're going to introduce uh, Kate Edlington. Um, she's the founder of uh, um, uh, Global Consideration. Again, what we see here with the speaker is that uh, um, she is trained in uh, uh, horticulture. She has sold New Zealand produce uh, nationwide, uh, dairy, beef, and, and all those nice New Zealand goodies. Um, she even owned her own dairy farm. And um, so also Kate is being able to look at this from all angles. Um, and now she's using her experience to guide and mentor um, uh, young, uh, in, innovative uh, people that try to come up with a sustainable uh, New Zealand produce and how they can actually bring that to market. Um, uh, Kate, in one of her ventures now, she is focusing on hemp protein. And uh, I am going to uh, leave it at this. And Kate, thank you very much. Thank you, Vim. Thank you for the invitation um, from Blink to speak this morning. Um, the purpose of this talk is to give you a brief glimpse into the hemp industry through the window of an innovative company, which is meeting the increasing consumer demands for sustainable 
and natural plant-based proteins. To be clear, at this point today, I'm talking about industrial hemp, cannabis, cannabis sativa, L, commonly referred to as hemp, yielding seeds from the seed head and fibre from the stalk. It has THC levels less than 0.35 parts per million. Therefore, there's no psychoactive experience, unlike its twin sister, marijuana. Right, now we've got that clear, we can proceed. Hemp fibre crops have been farmed over centuries. Think of the tall ships which arrived in New Zealand with our forefathers. They reportedly carried 60 tonnes of hemp in ropes, far less the sailcloth. Today, hemp farming has returned to Europe, Asia and the US for fibre, food and medical products. Until recently, New Zealand, the New Zealanders industry has failed to proliferate due to poor public perception, the social stigma and unfavourable legislation. However, the hemp crop offers a nutritionally dense seed head, making up about 3 to 4% of the plant. This, this protein contains all 20 amino acids and the essential and the essential as amino acids that um, that has just been spoken about omega threes, which are easily taken up by the body. A GLA, a gamma linoleic acid index, which lends itself to anti-inflammatory properties. Hemp offers a further lever to farmers looking to add diversity, diversity and profitability to in a cash crop. Hemp benefits soil profile with its strong taproot system, requires little inputs, grows well in most places in New Zealand, as long as there's adequate moisture for the first 30 to 45 days. Hemp is capable of sequestering carbon reportedly anywhere from 2.5 to four times faster than that of trees, such as Pinus radiata. It's also reported to be able to clean soils, uptaking nitrogen and heavy metals. As Vim said, I had the, spent the last six months, the privilege of the last six months, working in a fledgling group of companies under the banner of Plant Based New Zealand. Plant Based New Zealand has subsidiary companies trading as the Brothers Green, a hemp food company, Koaka, a hemp skincare company offering a full range of various products, Original Canvas, a hemp apparel company, and they have a main a, a major shareholding in mainland hemp, a hemp crom cropping and processing company based in Colverton in the Hiranui here in Canterbury, or north of Canterbury, sorry. These companies are the progeny of a pharmacist, a rural banker, and latterly a dairy industry manager and wellness coach. The three really driven individuals who are passionate about the positive attributes to diet, hemp offers, the environment, and then in New Zealand's agri sector, the overall health of Aotearoa New Zealand. Today, I, I want you to get a feel for the level of con the level of consumers and producers participation in the hemp industry here in New Zealand. A look at what innovation looks like through the Brothers Green experience and some key requirements for leadership in this developing industry. So up until now, but in New Zealand, domestically, our diets have evolved from New Zealand produce and high quality proteins from the dairy and red meat sectors. With, with the introduction of more and more processed foods packed with additives, Internationally, New Zealand is known as a clean source of quality meat and dairy products. New Zealand does this really well. We supply fresh, pasture-fed, free-range animal proteins, which have a traceable origin and route to market, all processed under 
extremely tight food safety requirements. With the growing global trend seeking plant-based proteins, New Zealand must remain relevant, acknowledging the international and domestic consumer environmental trends. We must meet the demands and forge new markets in the sector. New Zealand hemp products can be, tra can be traced from paddock to plate, just as our other fine products can be. New Zealand does have a premium plant-based complete protein available to sit alongside New Zealand lamb, beef and dairy products. Sorry, I'm just going to flip my slide. I'm just going to... Thank you. The, this slide is just an example of a few of the Brothers Green products. Is the New Zealand consumer ready for hemp? Well, New Zealand was the, one of the last, is the last country in the world to pass legislation allowing hemp to be consumed by humans. Perversely, hemp is not able to be used as a stock food at this point in time, perhaps a barrier to be addressed imminently. With the update in legislation of November 2018, hemp was finally legislated as fit for human consumption, just what early adopters had been working towards. The Brothers Green had, ha had preempted this by launching a hemp seed oil and already had already commenced formulating new products. The game is finally on. The Brothers Green have successfully tapped into a growing segment of New Zealand consumers embracing he he hemp products, eager to understand the product range available, as well as the benefits of hemp. Many of these consumers are not only motivated by nutritional value of the hemp seed, but the benefits of hemp to the environment and the planet long term. The Brothers Green have grasped every opportunity to educate New Zealanders. They, to, to keep the conversation forefront of mind, they're often speaking four to six times in a week. They, they are sell, they're in farmers markets selling their products, they're, in, they're at regional fairs, they do in-store tastings. They, last year they were, involved, they were invited to be part of the Farmlands Ladies Night, so they were up and down, spent five weeks up and down the country talking to the rural community about the benefits of hemp. AMP shows, and most latterly, they were profiled in the Kiora magazine. Their drive to educate New Zealand about hemp is insatiable. So from this, my perspective, from my perspective, I see consumers being excited by hemp food and the opportunities. This, along with the aid of social media, the transfer of knowledge has seen this segment grow enormously, especially over the last 12 months. Are farmers ready to farm hemp? The stigma attached to hemp and the lack of visibility for route to market, understandably, has left farmers unsure how to jump aboard. With, the recent, with little recent research available, those with pioneer tendencies have become involved and will reap the benefit economically and environmentally. Farmers need to be confident there is a market before they'll undertake due diligence and try growing hemp. The first, the first hurdle is a license must be applied for and received from the Ministry of Health prior to planting. Now, there's the first anomaly in a growing industry. However, I'm sure with good industry leadership, this will be sorted out. Farmers are pragmatic, so will be motivated to incorporate hemp into their systems for environmental considerations, sustainable crop rotation, soil remediation, bioremediation, and environmental regeneration. And of course, if there is a processor close by for a contractor to grow, for a grower to contract to. 
farmers are definitely moving to incorporate hemp in the, their farm practices, as can be seen from the Ministry of Health's licences issued. In 2017, 200 hectares of hemp was, were grown under licence. In 2019, 4,000 hectares um, worth of licences were issued. Now we believe about 1,500 of those were for the fibre. So the conversation is gaining momentum. There is real interest. The sharing of ideas and farming practice motivates other farmers to get involved. The Brothers Green re recently demonstrated this by initiating a field trip, inviting a f uh, initiating a field trip to the hemp farm in North Canterbury just prior to the onset of harvest. They opened up the invitation to urban, urban consumers interested farmers as well as farmers contract, currently contracting. The travel was made by bus with speakers on board the buses um, speaking about various various aspects of the industry. They um, disembarked the buses and COVID in, had further discussions, a lunch, a plant-based lunch was offered and then returned to the, to the city. Interest was so keen, two bus loads went to Colvard in that day. The sharing of ideas and farming, and farming practices and dietary requirements were all discussed. It was a fabulous day. With the commissioning of the recent commissioning of mainland hemp's processing plant in Colverant, this offers farmers the ability to toll process. At this stage, this plant's the only place in, South Island, in the South Island offering this service. Farmers up until recently have, have to contract grow for other businesses. So sorry, that's the slide of the mainland hemp and drying facility. Right, um, in terms of establishing a new market I want to, uh, and innovation, I'm going to just talk, give you an example. Last October, the Brothers Green Hempy Bar was launched into New, new World South Island and then into and which then were into then moved into the North Island. This bar was born of the idea of offering children a nutritious, healthy snack bar and and to introduce them a good brain food and for kids to meet kids' dietary requirements, whether they be gluten free, nut free, soy free. The bar was formulated to avoid these to avoid these ingredients it's sweetened with new zealand blueberries and the fat content is through coconut so it has it has good protein 18 percent hemp and has a low gi so i'll just flip this video on Looks like we've got a little bit of trouble with sound there, um, but this will be uh, linked in the email, so you'll be able to watch this video um, afterwards. Sorry about that, Kate.
Okay. Um, okay. So sorry about this. Uh, so the this, show, this the video you'll see shows um, the level of innovation, how the and the bar was formulated, and and the the prize the prize for okay let me just go back um, the 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 competition was the um, food innovation food innovation co uh, competition it was the inaugural competition um, sponsored by the ministry run by the ministry of awesomeness here in Christchurch and sponsored by Foodstuff South Island. Um, the boys won this, the Brothers Green won this, and the prize was the, was the entry into Food Stuff South Island Network. Um, okay. Um, the, product, the product had to stand alone. So the product has been launched into this into the South Island uh, network, and and the prize was it had to, it was a, it was online it was available for twenty six weeks, and but all the, and to stay on the shelves it had to meet K, the KPIs um, that foodstuffs expected it to meet. And I'm pleased to I'm pleased and very proud to say that the KPIs up until COVID have been met and exceeded. So the uptake within the supermarket chains, both in the South Island and the North Island, has been great. So from here, the hemp, hemp oil, the original branded product of the Brothers Green, has also gained entry um, in a number of foodstuffs outlets and with other products um, in the wings. So if this sounds like if this sounded like an easy ride, I'm sorry you've missed the video. Um, I am sorry to have misled you. I can assure you this ride continue this ride continues and is successful its success is due to the passion, the grit and the determination of the team involved. There have been several major hurdles to overcome and store tastings and the, a continue to fill the, the education piece. Education on hemp is so important. Understanding the FMCG, the language, the rules, the hierarchy all takes time. However, the ride is worth it and in order to mainstream hemp, the hemp protein. At the same time the hempy bar um, was being launched, Future de developments and opportunities had to be kept in mind. So, with um, a pharmacist in the team, the, uh, the other one of the other companies, Kawaka, um, which offers the skincare range, uh, healing balms, lip balms, skin serums, bar soaps, deodorant, shampoo, all now are now, all now distributed through CDC, New Zealand's National Pharmaceutical Distribution Centre. New products are being, at the same time as the hemp was being, the hempy bar was being launched, there were uh, Kawaka products being launched. It's a pretty crazy time. But this shows you further, there's opportunities for further products other than food to use New Zealand grown hemp seeds. With this level of commitment to the hemp industry and the shareholding in mainland hemp, being able to address, say, process and dress seeds post harvest, the plant based group, Brothers Green team and Kawaka, have vertically integrated their supply chain, giving growers certainty of a market and secure, at the same time securing their own raw materials for the group. This is real commitment and innovation and has been achieved in just two short, less than two short years. Successful innovation open, opens opportunities to collaborate, 
Now, the Brothers Green are always open to collaboration. They want to place as much New Zealand growing hemp into the products as they can to make the environment, to make the environmental gains for the planet. Collaborations have been done, for example, with Just Pete's, a naturally fermented drinks company in Nelson. Chow, Chow Cacao, a, a chocolate company using fair trade cocoa and with the Brothers Green Hemp Seeds and Bars Incorporated. This has been a great addition to the range as it's, as it's a plant-based plant chocolate. Oops, I'm not having much luck today, sorry. Social collaboration is with like-minded companies is, is, uh, is, also, um, is also very important. A current example is, the, is, in the, is the healthcare heroes, um, which where the, where the brothers have, have collaborated have collaborated with other like-minded companies, Otis Milk, Pix Peanut Butter, the Chia Sisters, Bay Road, and the Two Rook Sister, Phil Sisters, the filled hampers and given them away to essential services that have um, battled through the COVID lockdown. Such ventures in conjunction with the social media are incredibly powerful, again, fueling the conversation and adding to the power of the brand. Entrepreneurs uh, will be attracted to the industry as well, offering further additional working capital, new ideas, and new ideas for ranges of products. And even at a time when a step change is required in the business and appropriate time for expansion. So the keys to leadership, to leadership in the industry, as I see it, is a good story which can be, be, can be conveyed well and will intrinsically motivate people and strengthen the brand further. The Brothers Green story is, briefly, oh look, there's, our, there's, the, there's the cocoa, the chocolate. Um, the Brothers Green story is Brad, a rural banker, identified his customers in a dairy down identified in a dairy downturn, accompanied by a drought, needed another lever to mitigate risk and offer, offer a further re revenue stream. He was encouraging his clients to inject a diversity into their production systems. However, with the propensity for drought conditions to set up in North Canterbury, he quickly identified hemp as a crop to pursue, which also addressed the plant-based protein, protein trend he was seeing as well. Brendan, a pharmacist, was horrified by the poor nutrition and health problems he was seeing present. He was looking to formulate a healthy supplement on the verge of importing pea protein as when he heard, when a doctor friend said to him, hey, how about looking at hemp? He researched it and found the protein profile and the GLA index was particularly interesting, which led him into the hemp industry. These two had a meeting of the minds and from here, their hemp business model was conceived in 2017. And they only surrendered their, their full-time jobs in 2009, at the beginning of 2019. The more they work together, the more, more ideas are being propagated. However, they have a good story and an audacious mission to improve human health through nutrition. Leadership starts with a good idea, a good story, vision and a mission. So it's really important that networking across all channels is followed. Politically, we need we politically we need to ensure that legislation um, reflects reflects the actual state of the industry. Across the industry, the industry can't work in silos. This is this is a dangerous situation, situation, and whilst there are commercial sensitivities, knowledge sharing is important. Similar 
similar industries, for example, the Kiwi quinoa producers, producing quinoa, quinoa in the North Island, are often sharing their, sharing their information and leveraging contacts with, with the um, Brothers Green. Um, academic networking, this link um, is, and Lincoln, all the universities um, need to be pulled into the network. In early April, I heard Dave Jordan from Hemp Farm in an interview on the radio say that most universities working on, working on research projects, it'd be really great to see a registry of academic research being undertaken. Education, education and education is required for good leadership. The myths and stigma attached to consuming and farming hemp must be dispelled. Having great stories, storytellers and being available to converse at every level is important. Great leaders are going to need to attend overseas forums at some point in the future, hopefully, to get the latest research trends. Research is being done in other parts of the world. However, we need to find New Zealand's version, our own Kiwi Cross variety. Um, particularly of interest, the, the uh, research around carbon needs to be addressed. Lead it, the industry leaders need to look at this. Um, more and more, the, the uh, the topic of carbon is uh, at the forefront. And once we get some research quantified and qualified data, farmers will be able to lobby for hemp farming to be taken into consideration for carbon, carbon credits. The New Zealand Hemp Industry Association ha has been est established and hosts a biennial iHemp Summit. The inaugural conference was held in June 2018 with 34 nations and international speaker, nas, national and international speakers. Unfortunately, the 2020 IHEMP Summit has been cancelled and to date is not going to be a virtual, a virtual conference, which is disappointing. Finally, leaders must be seen, be seen doing doing the work, doing the mahi, they must be seen to walk the, walk the talk. From what I have observed, the hemp industry remains relatively small and fragmented. However, it has legs which are growing rapidly. There are many exciting opportunities underway. I recently attended a venture capital soiree in Auckland and of the 20 invited companies, four of them were related to hemp some really good innovation going on in this space. Because the industry is young, the passion and the energy is palpable. Anyone involving, involved as well in hemp is willing to talk hemp. So if you're in the audience and think, where can I start? Feel free to reach out to Blink and they'll give you some contact details to start the conversation. I hope you do get an opportunity to see the video. Um, it's worth having a look at and it's, it is most inspiring. Thank you. And I hope this has given you a glimpse into the hemp. Thank you, Kate. Um, and I think if you stop sharing, then I can... Thank you so much. And we will get into the Q&A session. Um, and what we're going to do is, I'm going to read up the answers, or the questions that you guys uh, that you guys uh, posted um, uh, online, and we'll uh, um, ask the speakers to actually uh, comment on those. But before we do that, um, I again want to say thank you to uh, to all three speakers because uh, I've learned a lot and uh, we started off with uh, uh, Sue talking about her sheep dairy and basically proving to us that the concept is working 
and C is basically valuing um, a short value chain or an integrated value chain. And I've also learned that milk is not milk, and I already saw that some of the questions are relating to that, so we'll, we'll, cover, we'll cover those. Then it was on to Karen, and Karen basically told me protein is not protein. So there you go. This is, again, a learning that I, that I, that I uh, embraced. And basically, she said she told us that we need to focus on essential nutrients. And um, she basically had a message that I think when consumers look at sustainability, they need to consider the mix uh, of taking the health of the planet, but also the health of their own uh, body in consideration when they make uh, choices in their in their diet. And she emphasized that protein was definitely um, an essential part of that balanced diet. And then um, we had Kate uh, talking to us about hemp, and I've learned that hemp is not cannabis. And coming from the Netherlands, that is uh, quite a good revelation. Um, but hemp is basically one of the new novel sustainable protein sources that are being trialed and are being marketed. So with other words, basically uh, uh, enhancing uh, our, our choice for healthy diets. And um, like Kate said, with legislation now in place, uh, growth is definitely expected in that sector. So what I'll do now is I will go to uh, the questions and I will ask uh, the various uh, speakers to give me uh, an, uh, an, an, an answer, a relevant uh, um, um, And what I'll do is when the speaker is actually answering, I will um, mute my microphone so that uh, uh, you guys can, uh, I will not uh, uh, disturb uh, the noise or uh, of, the, of the people, of the person sp speaking. We're starting off with uh, a compliment. Thank you so much, um, uh, because I actually saw that uh, y uh, some of you were basically saying, well, um, thank you very much for giving um, uh, uh, a balanced view on, on different, uh, on different uh, uh, protein sources. So um, you're welcome. And that, is, that, that came from, from Lee. Um, I think, uh, Sue, the first question uh, coming from Nick is for you and it is um, you made a comment that you're not making a lot of money present what gives you the confidence that you will do that in the future oh that's a good question um, what we are making money um, I guess we have found that there are um, it's difficult for small businesses to get um, to make savings. We've been in sort of an experimental mode, trialing new products and things. So there's been a lot of probably a, a, little, a little amount of wastage and a, a product, and we have been um, trying to get into new markets. So we have, but we we have um, built and and run a and run a, a cheese shop at the Riverside Farmers Market. And we have been working really hard to get out and and get um, product into restaurants and things like that. Um, we're doing fine. We're doing okay. It's certainly better clipping a ticket right across the right across the value chain just than just being part of it and being at the mercy of of um, trying to to mar to market a product and that not succeeding. Um, I guess we went in with reasonably reasonably cautious optimism. Um, COVID-19 hasn't isn't helping. Um, the, our market's been closed for some time, for six, seven, eight weeks, and we have been um, forced to go online, looking at different ways at, at doing things. And we're learning and doing it better. It was incredibly challenging to be working full time um, at paid jobs, both Guy and I t teaching literally and um, farming and making cheese and other products. And we've broadened. We've broadened our range of products, and sheep, sheep dairy products are quite are seen as quite unusual in New Zealand. And so it's taken quite a while to educate consumers about why they should try it and why it's good for them. And so we now have a broader range of product, which I think is, is my, is, there's a bit of seasonality about. We have um, gone into making sheep milk gelato, and it's superb, and it's just it was to die for, but it's kind of more as a summer product than a winter one. So we, you know, we we have products that are better suited across the season, and it's really early days for us. 
we, um, yeah, we're learning as we go. We've made a few mistakes, but we're going to be millionaires by Christmas. Thank you, Sue. I think the next question is for you as well. Um, in your presentation, you used U.S. data to compare nutritional levels. Um, there is a there is a question why uh, you used U.S. data rather than New Zealand data. Oh gosh, I can't say that. Um, um, <laughs> gosh, there is, I, as far as I'm aware, there is no New Zealand comparative stuff that I've had access to. Um, Heinlein is it's an old set of it's an old set of data, but it's um, it's quoted by everybody. I just copied what I thought was the most accurate um, information available. Um, if you know a better set of data that I could use, I'd be happy to look at that. Um, I, I, I think it's maybe, it depends on the kind of sheep and it, it, there'll, be, there'll be some variation in those numbers, but on the whole, I think they, st they stack up in terms of the species breakdown. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, and Ellen, who actually posted the question, has put in a, a link to a website, so you can definitely uh, um, uh, have a look at that later. Um, the next question is for um, uh, uh, Kate. Um, can you clarify um, uh, your amino acid introduction? Uh, are there any essential amino acids within the, with the, within the hemp protein? Yes, there are, but actually, um, yes, there definitely are. Um, however, I suspect uh, our nutritionist friend, Karen, you might be able to answer this one better. I think, you're, uh, that's re I think you'll have some good information on that. Perhaps Karen could help me there. I think you did a great job, um, Kate, actually. And actually, hemp is um, one of the plant proteins that does have the complete quota of essential amino acids. Uh, whether the amount um, stacks up to um, the amount that you get in an egg really depends on how much of hemp you have compared to how much of egg. But certainly, hemp is, is one of the superior uh, proteins that, um, that does have that complement of um, essential amino acids. So you, you did a good job there. Thanks, Karen. Um, the next question I think is for Sue again, and um, talks about a per unit of products. How does, for example, one kilogram of protein from sheep milk compare to dairy milk in terms in, on environmental impact water, uh, uh, greenhouse gases, emissions, etc. I'm going to pass this really difficult question to my husband. Sure. Could you hear it? Yeah. Could you, could you come up? You have, to sheep milk a yep. um, you have to come over to the... Oops, I'm just sticking my earpiece back in. Um, we, right now, I can't tell you, is the honest answer. Um, good question, though. And um, I'm not sure that there's a hell of a lot of analysis about this kind of stuff. Sheep dairy in the New Zealand context is relatively under under researched, and there's quite a bit of work going on at the moment um, through some some um, research research networks to look into stuff like that. But I don't know of any. I don't know that I could answer that off the top of my head. Well, thank you for that, Sue. Um, Question, um, and most probably um, it, this is a question for Karen. Um, animals are supplemented with B12 as well. So um, uh, they. Uh, so what's okay? No, you know what I'll do. I'll read the question rather than trying to interpret it. Animals are supplemented with B12, so they have the B12 we need when we are eating their products. This is one step removed from a vegan or a vegetarian eating su the supplements themselves. And is this an important note to make? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Um, and I suppose, um, I suppose it amounts to the same thing. If I think about it logically, um, one you could say that both, um, both 
scenarios, you're not getting it totally naturally because the animals are being supplemented in it. And of course it comes from bacteria. So if they're eating manure and things that they are, they are getting it that way. So you could say part of it is, is a natural occurrence of, of how they would get it. Whereas vegans would need to supplement. Um, I guess if you have a, a, a vegan supplemented with B12, and an omnivore who gets it through animals, you'd, it, it would amount to the same thing. And um, I think what I, what I want to emphasize here is that I'm not anti-vegan at all. Vegans just need to take um, a lot more care and provide that level of supplementation. And what worries me is that the youngsters coming through that think that they need to be plant only um, don't necessarily know about um, the supplementation that they need to that they need to do. But just to answer the question, I, I guess it amounts to the same thing. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, Kate, there is a question here, if you can provide a reference to the study that you used, the, um, uh, that hemp grows very well in New Zealand. So uh, what I'm, I'm gonna ask Kate to uh, uh, give it to us and we will, uh, when we send you the, uh, 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 the, the, the link we will uh, uh, give you that as well. Mm -hmm. um, Kate, staying with you, is there a cap in current legislation on hemp growing in New Zealand, or is that if you have a if you have a permit, you can grow whatever you want to grow? Yes, but the, the per, yes, the, but the permit is constrained to a an area. So, um, there's, as far as I'm aware, there's not a cap, but your permit is certainly a, um, must can only is only for the area that you've applied for. Well, that is good news. I might uh, dig up my backyard. Five hundred eleven dollars per permit. Uh, Kate just said. Um, Sue, where do you see the sheep industry going? And you were talking about that there was lack of cohesion. How do you see that being achieved in the future, or do you think it will remain a very niche uh, a, a protein source? Um. No, I think it's right now it's a very mixed bag. There are the two key players in the North Island are certainly not niche. Um, there's a very successful exporting exporting businesses. Um, I I hope it's not niche into the future. We're trying very hard in in the South Island to pull groups of people together to be able to um, build the size of their flocks. Um, Develop the skills to to move beyond the hobby level or the or the small business level. Um, I'm a bit nervous about the fact that lots of people may, on the back of the stories that we tell about the fabulousness of the product, will all start developing small dairies. We're all competing on a on a, on a domestic market and. Thank you very much, Sue, for that. Um, Karen, you talked about the nutritional benefits be benefits of plant uh, proteins, and but also you talked about that some of them are being lost in food processing. Um, can we, could we improve on that? Uh, if you look at the, the trend that consumers are moving into plants, can we can we protect plant protein while processing? I'm not sure that I talked about being lost in food processing, um, but more so I talked about that plant foods have natural components in them like phytates and oxalates which um which render some of the nutrients less bioavailable i think that might have been I, i'm not sure if the if, if if there's another question that comes in that clarifies that then i'll be able to help but i i don't know what you can do about that in terms of food technology where where whether you can um 
produce, you can grow plants that um, have less phytates in them. I, I, I don't know. These are natural compounds that are inherent in, in, in the plant structure. Um, so I don't know from a food tech perspective what can be done. But I, I suppose if you've got whatever you, you've got, whether it's plant or animal, and you get some kind of degradation in nutrient, um, in nutrient content uh, from food processing or, or any, anything else, I, I guess you're left with fortification and just adding more to account for what you lose would be really what, we, um, what we're dealing with. I mean, we've got soils that are low in um, nutrients like selenium, and, um, and, and that reflects in selenium content of our food as well. So we, we might have to resort to fortification, um, but I, I'm not quite sure that's, that's needed at this point because we're not seeing overt deficiencies come through. I hope that answers the question. I, I think it did, at least for me it did. Um, you, Karen, I'm staying with you. You talked about uh, recommendations for meat and or protein uh, consumption. Um, how does New Zealand, eh, the, 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 rec the, uh, the recommendations from New Zealand, how do they compare with other uh, countries in the world? Uh, are they lower or higher than, for example, Europe? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, the, the beauty about this, doing this online is that I, um, I saw the question and I had a little chance to, to ask, um, ask Dr. Google because um, I wanted to see where it came from. And I know um, around the world, all the dietary guidelines ha have really changed their, um, their guideline around meat, some being around quantity and some being around quality limiting, um, pr limiting processed meat. And it's really come from the World Cancer Research Fund, which has recommended that um, consumption of red meat stay between 350 and 500 grams um, per week, which is around three portions. So we're around five, 500 grams, which is the sort of upper end of that. Um, every other country has got a guideline and they tend to have a limit around that 300 to 500. There, there is some documentation that the UK went right down to 70 grams of red meat per, per week, which is ridiculously low. Um, and the reason why the, the dietary guidelines have changed have come from a series of studies on red meat and, and health outcomes. And these are probably the hottest debated uh, studies that, that are around. And unfortunately, what you see in the, the, the headlines that causes the, the clickbait is not quite what you see in the articles. And this, if, you, if you apply some critique, they're quite methodologically flawed and the interpretations are, are flawed. And I think there's a big difference between eating lots of red meat that comes from hot dogs and poor quality sources uh, versus good quality meat from New Zealand that's predominantly grass fed. And if you eat that in a whole food context, um, I don't believe that there's any health um, problems associated with eating more meat than, than the requirements. So again, I think the studies have, um, the studies have been a little bit, I don't want to say misleading, but they haven't told the full story. And actually when you go into um, the World Cancer Research database of studies, and you look at how many of these studies are actually randomized controlled trials, like actual interventions, rather than just looking at observations, there are none. So there is not one study that has been done that is an intervention which indicates cause and effect. All the outcomes have been from observational correlation-based research where this is a lot of confounding. So you can, while you can find associations, you can't actually say that one thing causes another thing. So um, that's a long-winded long um, answer to the question, which is I think New Zealand's probably on the higher end of that um, sort of global red meat limitation, which is a good thing. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, Dennis asking a, a question uh, uh, looking into reptile uh, protein or proteins coming from reptiles. Um, and um, interesting um, because we are, of course, looking at insects and insect proteins 
because the fact that insects can uh, turn uh, waste into a more uh, uh, highly valued uh, protein source. I haven't come across anything on reptiles. Did you, Karen? I haven't come, uh, come across anything um, on reptiles either. Um, but I, you know, when I saw that question, I just had to go, you know, my initial thoughts were, getting back to um you know the wet markets in china and you know what's happening there with with um consumption of animals that maybe shouldn't be consumed and it just made me a little a little bit nervous really so i i don't i don't really know i don't really know the answer there from a um from an ethical or political or nutritional side but the thought of eating reptiles considering i used to own a reptile when i lived in south africa as a pet um, doesn't sit uh, that well with me um so so i would yeah i think i'll just hang with that answer for the moment yeah i think i yeah yeah <laughs> um oh i'm being told I'm being told, and I listen because uh, you don't see this. But I'm I'm at home. I'm in a room with with ladies, and here I'm in a room with with uh, ladies as well. The only the only real support is is is, is guy. But like uh, him and myself are doing doing what we are being told. And of course, I'm being told that I need to uh, look at the last question. Um, and um, any suggestions for a last question? There is no. So I will uh, pick one. And I think what, um, oh no, I think I'm gonna start with uh, not a question, but information because um, Richard uh, um, uh, made us aware that there is um, a hemp summit and expo in Rotorua in May, 2021. So for all people that are interested in in the hemp uh, uh, the hemp industry, there is an there is an opportunity at the uh, 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 in Rotorua in uh, twenty. I think that is about it uh, for everybody, uh, guys. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for um, uh, uh, your questions and your interaction in this new in this new normal. Thank you so much for the speakers. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, uh, uh, Karen. And thank you, Blink Team, because this would not have been possible with this wonderful team that uh, I'm allowed to be part of. Thank you so much. And like we said, this recording will be uh, available available online and will be emailed to you. Uh, yes, the, I, I see a note. So it will be emailed to you. Thank you so much. And we will see you soon. Um, so, yeah, I think that's it. I'm looking at my, yep, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.